Okay, let's start today. Uh, so today's topic is finite impulse response filters and infinite impulse response filters. But before we go into the topic, I would like to actually uh, teach you something about Finnish weather. How we name weather phenomena. Since now they have been really cold weather in the Europe. Overall, the Europe has been really freezing over. So Sweden actually they they named this this phenomenon as snow cannon, meaning they have had a lot of snow in Sweden because of that uh, because of that very cold weather. And UK actually that was also the hit the uh, word news. They call this one as a, the beast from the east. So they think it's a terrible thing. Russian they call it Siberian bear. Sorry about the accent. <laughs> I, I think it's a little bit funny. But anyways, Siberian bear, meaning a very dangerous. Get, guess what the Finns named that weather phenomena? Uh, that was yesterday. They call it Wednesday. Just normal day. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, actually, there's also a good reason for it. Oh, actually, I, I think I'll just leave it like that. So, there's a very good reason. It, it didn't come as uh, cold as the forecast says, because of, there is also another kind of uh, weather phenomenon with caps the cold weather upstairs and uh, actually keeps the lower uh, lower the atmosphere a little bit warmer. It's called inversion layer. And that just happened over Finland. So it has been actually the nighttime temperatures. I checked something between minus 20 to minus 25 and the daytimes uh, basically minus 20 to minus 15 in, in southern side. And it, it's, it's perfectly normal for winter. Okay. Anyways, I, I, I just love that joke. <laughs> right. Um, so let's go to the topic, which is the uh, FIR filter design. Wait a minute. Why it doesn't? Uh, okay. 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 No. Let's open it in a Google Slides. Mm -hmm. There, present mode. Now I have full screen. Good. So, FIR filter design. And now we are talking about the finite impulse response systems that work as filters. There are also other uh, finite impulse response systems. For example, in control. Uh, loops, you may have a, a finite impulse response controller for the loop uh, as a part of the loop. Um, but the uh, controlling loops are actually IIR systems. Uh, but anyways, so first I go through the uh, fil filter fundamentals. So they are basically four different classes based on the uh, spectral response and it's a low pass, band pass, band stop, high pass, and multiband filters. So this basically the last one, the multiband filter is, is a selection of everything else than those uh, classical filters. Uh, okay, so those are the low pass filter parameters. Um, I should actually just draw that one again since uh, this requires a little bit explaining to do. So I'll talk now just about uh, about the uh, uh, digital filters. So we have a digital filter, meaning that we can actually filter frequencies uh, between zero to Nyquist frequency, which is sampling rate over two. And then on low pass filter, we have a cut of three frequencies frequencies somewhere there. So that is the uh, uh, our design uh, uh, 
the, 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 the um, parameters so, so that basically your information should be here. So the information what you like to uh, uh, the, the keep, that's there. Follow pass filter. Which means that you want to keep the uh, pass band as flat as possible. But sometimes it's not possible. Okay? The, uh, that cut of frequency actually is defined by how much you actually are tolerating either ripple or what is your minus 3 dB point of the filter. Okay. On, uh, on systems that don't have any ripple, then it's minus 3 dB point. Four. But for example, remember analog filters, there's the uh, Chebyshev filter, which has some ripple on it. So that's basically the, uh, uh, if you have that kind of case, uh, let me, I'll just use another color. So you would have some passband ripple. So basically the point, uh, hmm. This one here would uh, then uh, uh, define the cutoff frequency. So it's it's the amount of ripple you have, and when it uh, goes the last time below that one, then it's your cutoff frequency. Okay, and your information actually is on pass band. So this is called pass band. So those are the frequencies that actually are passing the system. Then basically, uh, on usual digital filter, you have some sort of this kind of behavior on the stop band. The stop band attenuation is defined by this point here. So that's basically all that matters. And the attenuation actually is measured in dB from the, uh, the uh, middle of the passband down to that point. So that's the attenuation A. Stop band attenuation. Okay, uh, then, oh, okay, that's a little bit funny picture. Now, I in this picture, I have the uh, transition band. So basically, transition band is defined by, um, I'm running out of the colors, uh, this point here, which is basically on this uh, edge, the first go, uh, first point which goes be, uh, be, uh, below the stop band attenuation. So that actually, uh, 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 defines the uh, stop band start frequency and in between here that's the transition band so let's just say okay filter is in transition so we, we have pass band transition band stop band okay <clears throat> so basically when you're doing filter design Depending on the application, you will be defining what is your cutoff frequency, how much ripple you uh, actually uh, uh, can have, what is the attenuation, and what is your transition bandwidth. So the filter uh, design parameters are those. So in in general. I think I have this picture also later. You try to basically fill mm, this kind of box so that these areas are no no areas for the design. You have the passband. transition band and stop band. But within these uh, 
values actually you can have almost any filter what just matches those so uh, on the pass band you may either have this kind of behavior or just that kind of behavior or just something like that okay yes a little bit messy so you can feel anything here transition band as as so, as uh, long as you don't go into illegal areas it can be anything and stop band could be like this or just going like that it can be even like that it doesn't matter since it still uh, fulfills the, the filter requirements so the filter design is actually the parameters are defined quite easily and, and here you have the cutoff frequency and then stop and start frequency okay maybe i should actually draw that one ripple okay and well the attenuation all right so um what else okay same parameterization actually goes also for the high pass filter except it's you'll just reverse the uh, frequency axis so stop and attenuation is defined by the highest highest point in stop band and then you have this ripple here and what it is in between is transition band band pass okay band pass actually uh, differs from this uh, low pass and high pass in a sense that it has two stop bands which may or may not have different uh, parameters for for the uh, stop band so in this case there's uh, the higher stop band stop band two attenuation is higher transition bandwidth is uh, wider but the, here we have the uh, uh, on, on the left hand side on the lower band pass uh, stop at uh, stop band we have a basically lower uh, uh, the higher well less attenuation on the stop band but then we also have the trans band is a little bit narrower okay this is just an example and then basically we have two uh cut of frequencies pass band is here okay band stop well oh, it's basically pass uh low pass plus high pass one stop band but two pass bands okay uh, this is just a um, reminder so pass band ripple a uh, lot the, the uh, this uh, stop band ripple doesn't matter since the signal is very low there in any case but the pass band ripple actually says how much do you tolerate this uh, uh, changing of of the uh, uh, amplitude response in pass band for audio filters for example if you if you there put the uh, minus 2 db ripple there that's fine that's fine you cannot uh, your he uh, ear cannot separate if there is that 2 minus 2 db ripple or not okay uh, and uh, basically when you allow ripple here it usually means that you can get the stop and attenuation better or uh, transition bandwidth narrower <clears throat> okay um, then a few words about FIR filter distance so, so those previous filters actually they were just generic for FIR and IIR filter both filter will actually uh, we will use the same design scheme and it has the same uh, characterization in frequency domain or in amplitude uh, frequency sense okay um but the um 
when you are doing a FIR filter design, you really have to have a reason for it. Uh, so why FIR? Two uh, very good reasons that comes directly from the uh, <clears throat> from uh, from the properties like FIR filter is always stable. Remember stability requirement uh, that all the uh, poles must be inside of the unit circle. Oh yeah, in FIR filters all the poles are actually in origin or cancel it all somewhere there on unit circle. Okay, so it's always stable. Um, what else? It always has also linear phase response. Well, not always. You can design it such that it has linear phase response. And that's basically when you select the impulse response symmetry, symmetric on the center value. You can also have a nonlinear uh, phase response for FIR. Um, there are these three methods, but uh, actually today we are going to exercise the windowing methods. Uh, so there are a couple of other methods. So impulse response truncation is one method. Uh, just to basically, so, so this is a nice way to start. See, it gives a nice uh, understanding of what we are doing here. Then the uh, windowing method is a simple design flow, but it does not give you optimal filters. Uh, there are actually a couple of uh, windowing method optimal generators, almost optimal generators, but th this is not necessarily the way to go on real life. Uh, and then there are some optimized design methods, those other ones. For example, there is, uh, let's see, uh, so-called Saramaki filter, which is a Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, professor in Technical University of uh, Tampere. He, he has made his own, own uh, procedure actually to, uh, or function to find out a optimized filter. FIR filter. Okay, so impulse response truncation, what we are talking about. So this is a brute force, crude way of making a, um, making estimate of a real life system. So simple way. Measure the step response of the system. So we start from unit step response, meaning you actually have the uh, uh, signal source. You run square wave to a system with low enough frequency. So we have that system, real life system H of S. And then you have the uh, uh, function generator with square wave output. You run that one in. So this is u mu of t, what you are running there in principle, or close approximation of it. What comes out is basically the uh, you're measuring the uh, 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 the step response in time. Uh, of course, you can sample it. Take a digitizer, you get the step response, rough step response. It's, it's not, you know, exactly that one since instead of, it, instead of getting the step response like that, you are actually having the uh, response from the edges of square wave. Okay, it's not exactly the same. But anyways, uh, from step response, you can make the impulse response 
which is s of n minus s of n minus 1. And when you have an impulse response, you just cut it. Remember, uh, all the natural systems are actually IIR systems. But when you, you have this kind of system, you can actually, well, it's your design. You can go and just uh, take just one part of the impulse response. So basically, you are actually multiplying it also with window. So you have the, uh, that impulse response multiplied by your favorite window. And um, yeah, that's FIR impulse response. And then you can actually uh, do the analysis and compare if this one actually gives the same uh, frequency response, for example, as that one. So to measure the impulse response, other uh, the frequency response of this, you would run the same generator, but with a, a different sinusoids and measure the A of omega and maybe the uh, Maybe this this um, uh, uh, phase response and uh, basically compare it with that one. Okay, I have some example here: a low pass uh, analog uh, analog low pass filter, just one microfarad capacitor here and one kilo ohm resistor. I'm running a, a the square wave here, and that's the uh, what is the, 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 the frequency response of that system supposed to be? Okay, uh, lab setup, function generator and oscilloscope. Then I measured the wave uh, form. Well, step function is not quite the step function as you see. That's yeah. <laughs> so that gives you some error already on this on the, on this this method. So, but step response is the blue graph. Then I took that one to uh, the octave and compare the analog. That's my analog model, and this is basically the digitized model here. So I took took the uh, well, impulse response and to make the uh, uh, Fourier transformation. Well, Fourier transform of, of, of impulse response is your frequency response. And yeah, okay. It follows, say, okay, up to about one kilohertz. Then it kind of falls apart. Um, Okay, uh, but anyways, the um, here I basically just model the uh, these measurements without the, the so so I have plenty of sources to go wrong here since I have some noise on the system as you can see there's a, a little bit of ripple here it's just just natural noise or oh, I have open wires this was just a crappy setup. Uh, but anyways, just to make a point. Um, and then, of course, the oscilloscope has some measuring error there. Uh, and that kind of things. And basically, you can see the noise here. So I had only about, well, the, I have noise floor somewhere at around minus 25 dB is the noise floor here. I cannot go better than that. And then the uh, all kind of other errors actually show the uh, that it starts to fall apart around one kilohertz. All right. Uh, and this kind of cutting the uh, impulse response actually fails always. Even if you had, say, uh, the best instruments ever you cannot actually compensate the window effect. 
So you are cutting the uh, in infinite impulse response and force it to finite impulse response. It means that you have this window, so you are actually multiplying the the uh, multiplying this with the your window, meaning that you are convoluting in frequency space. So even if you had perfect uh, for for the impulse response, if you even if you have the perfect you know behavior on the frequency axis, you still are um, convoluting this one with the sink or something else. So that actually will cause you this one to dip up. The other way of thinking of it, you this has frequencies above the Nyquist fre frequency. So this actually is the uh, alias part of the uh, of of your spectrum. Same effect, two different names. Okay, then this um, windowing method, which is the one that we are be uh, um, trying today. Just make a picture of that. So windowing method. This windowing method is actually quite, so I, I, I see it's almost genius. Since first of all, we start from the uh, right place. We start from the frequency domain design. Uh, think of the box again. Oops. Let's think that box. So we need a filter which fills this pot. Uh, I will start from this kind of box. Optimal box which has just the cut of frequency, unity gain on the passband, and then uh, uh, the amplitude goes to exactly zero for the rest of the spectrum. Uh, just a reminder, this is actually, a, you also has, have the, the, the negative frequencies here. I'm just drawing the right-hand side of the spectrum. Okay, that is in the frequency domain. How about if we take this one and do the uh, inverse Fourier transform of that spectrum? that actually gives us an impulse response. So if you take the impulse response, take the Fourier transformation of it, it gives you the frequency response and vice versa, of course, the frequency response, inverse Fourier transform gives you the uh, uh, impulse response. So we get H of T. Okay, I started with the continuous uh, frequency domain. This actually, the inverse Fourier transformation gives me a uh, continuous uh, time uh, domain of the impulse response. And for this box, you will get nice function called sync. Sync something T. I don't care about the what is inside of that one. Uh, so sync is the uh, sine x or x. Or that's sine of pi x divided by pi x. Sometimes the pi is omitted. Uh, you never know which one it is. <laughs> I have seen both on, on the literature. But anyway, so it's sine of pi x uh, divided by pi x. Okay, so that's the sync in continuous time domain. But no worries, we can always sample it. 
so we can do sampling. Something like that. So sampled sync at sampling rate, whatever, looks this. So we go to H of N. Uh, let's see, I think the Yeah, I'm not totally wrong. That's actually um pi n times fc over fn, where the fn is actually the sampling rate over 2. Okay, so this is, comes from mathematics. So you have a scaling factor for gain, and then you have this sink pi n fc over fn. I'm not totally sure about this one, but we will see when we try the um, uh, octave. That things that you must remember some things, details that you forget. <laughs> okay, so, uh, nice, we did that one, but this is supposed to be FIR, finite impulse response system. And the way to actually do this finite is to use a window so you, we will be actually multiplying this one with window. For example, a square window here. There. So that's a formula which should give me square-shaped uh, system. But we actually did a little bit of uh, damage the system by this windowing. Just like there, when we truncated this impulse response what we measured, this will also do the same effect for this truncated impulse response. Okay, so what we can do next, we can actually go and uh, go back from this HN and do the Fourier transform of HN. So there. So we are testing how close we are. This sink actually uh, that would produce exactly this box. Well, Fourier transform of Inverse Fourier transform is back to the mode. But this window, square shape window, will produce you a sink. That comes from the Fourier transform of the window. And now you have a multiplication in time space, meaning you have convolution in frequency space. Meaning that what comes out is the convolution of these. So it will actually end up, well, this is the absolute value of what it, what it ends up. And with some luck, you hit this part. Cut of frequency you will get automatically, right, from the sink. But the stop and attenuation and uh, stop and attenuation and, and transition bandwidth actually are uh, something that needs a little bit tweaking. So let's see. FC that's set on this side. 
So this is okay. Uh, then the uh, transition bandwidth. Well, let's put the uh, stop. Well, yeah, yeah, transition bandwidth. That's also one one that is easy to see what's actually happening. That you can adjust by multiplying in time is same as uh, division in frequency. So if you take more points to this uh, window, then you will actually squeeze the transition bandwidth. So basically window width, width is the uh, the one you can adjust, then the stop and attenuation, you also have Okay, the stop and attenuation, so, so if, if we can actually fix that one, the, the uh, uh, sink we cannot touch, okay, uh, the uh, stop and attenuation can be actually fixed with the window shape. If you take smoother window like this, you smooth the corners, there are less high frequency components. So you are concentrating more power on the uh, 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 low pass, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, lower frequencies and squeezing down the higher frequencies. So basically uh, smoother shape means more attenuation. All right. And the design order is one, two, three. <laughs> All right. So I think I have the same thing here. Yes, I have the same thing here. So some pictures, convolution frequency, and then when you have that one, and then basically well, in, in logarithmic scale. And then some, uh, there are some, <clears throat> a table of different uh, window shapes and how much you get stop and attenuation. So rectangular gives you only that 20 to 30 dB stop and attenuation. A Bartlett window, which is a, just triangle, simple to make you get uh, about 40 dB attenuation, 25 to 40 dB attenuation, depending on how you design. Hanning, half psychosymmetrically biased cosine, so it's cosine shape like that. So it, uh, it's a little bit of like a bell curve. That's also easy to produce. And that gives you already say 40, 60, uh, 80 dB attenuation. Um, Hamming, that's half cycle asymmetrically biased cosine, meaning it has a little bit offset in there, and that gives you already 60 dB. Blackman window, okay, uh, that's actually full half cycle cosine and full cycle harmonic, so that gives you 80 to 90 dB. Okay, uh, then there's a a uh, smooth window generator called Kaiser window, which basically you, there's a parameter that you adjust for getting the stop band attenuation at the level you want. Those are the most common. And those are the uh, differences. So the window shapes, they look almost the same, but the uh, oh, oh, okay, compared to the box, the blue one here, the triangle already gives you say 5 dB better here, but then we go into real windows like the Hamming. Hamming, uh, okay, but 
50 dB in this case. Hanning, well, it has a little bit of trouble here, but it actually goes deep here. And then Blackman, even better. So usually, well, my favorite is Blackman. <laughs> but anyways, uh, that, it's an easy pick. Then this is the effect of the transition bandwidth. Uh, uh, I have just now uh, changed the uh, N, meaning the uh, I'm, I'm chasing the uh, width of the window. So 11, 21, 41, 81, and the transition bandwidth goes all the time, narrower and narrower. The transition bandwidth adjustment is very simple. If you need half of the band, you just double the numbers. If you need, need one tenth of the transition bandwidth, you ten times you have need ten times more points. Okay. Then the next, so now we can design a low pass filter. We not just need sync, a properly shaped window, and then adjust the transition bandwidth from for uh, transition bandwidth by uh, adjusting the uh, width of your window. Um, how to make then other uh, than low pass filters? Everything starts from the low pass. So we have your low pass filter, LPF, which has a cutoff frequency and goes something like that. Good. Um, so if you modulate your low pass filter, amplitude modulate your low pass filter with cosine wave. So here you have the H of N. If you do modulation, meaning H of N multiplied with the cosine of, uh, that would be omega. Uh, N. Yes. Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, Omega C. Yes, Omega C N. What you would get. Well, uh, let's 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 do it the other, other way around. So, so basically, what you're doing is the uh, cosine two pi modulation frequency times n times t s. So sampling time times that one, okay, and that's just the index. So you 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 have a impulse response impulse response, and then you just modulate it with in time space, you modulate it with uh, frequency. So multiplication in time, okay, that's our modulation frequency here. Multiplication in time is convolution in frequency. So this will be convoluted with a peak like that, which means that we will get the filter transformed to the center of that modulation frequency. So that's what the modulation does. Same thing as, as in radio waves, the A modulation. How does it work? You multiply a, a signal with uh, uh, modulating radio frequency, transforms the information on both sides of that uh, the, the modulation frequency and then you can transfer it on, on radio. Okay. So, um, 
Okay, that's what does the, for the system. So now we have a band pass filter. All right. Uh, another, if you modulate this one with a cosine of pi times n, meaning actually you are modulating at Nyquist frequency. So modulation at Nyquist frequency, fs over 2. This would actually transform the low pass filter in here. And the cut off frequency of the original low pass filter is actually now our bandwidth of the new uh, high pass filter. Okay. Uh, it's n times minus 1 to power of n. So cosine n times pi plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1. All right. So actually the cut of frequency here would be um, fc2 or fc um, high pass. That actually is the Fs over 2 minus F, the original Fc. Remember that one. So, so when you're doing the, uh, 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 this, this high-pass filter design and you're designing the high-pass to have a cut-off here, then you need to do the low-pass design so that you will actually get it there, not, on the, uh, not just transforming the uh, low-pass filter there since it's... it's would, you would have the offset, big offset. Okay. But anyway, so low pass filter, the band pass filter, or high pass filter. Uh, okay. And then how about band stop filter? Well, there. Low pass plus high pass. If you have the same order number a low pass filter and high pass filter so band stop is same as low pass filter mm -hmm. plus high pass filter so you have low pass part and the high pass part so only thing actually what you need to be care careful is that now we are actually adding the uh, the stop bands with phase so uh, you need to have some error margin there so it can go up to uh, up to, uh, by 3 or actually can change up to 6 dB depending on your design if they are the, uh, as in this case all of those uh, maximums are actually on the same place. It will, the, the, uh, it will actually affect on the uh, design, so you need to make that uh, in, into account in design. Okay, but anyways, it's a band stop. And of course, remember to design the high, pa high pass filter cutoff frequency correctly. It's easier to just use the low pass filter and then tr transform it. Okay, so summary. Summary of windowing method. So basically select uh, minus 3 dB of uh, low pass filter. If you are planning on, on either high pass or band stop filter, then you need to take care of the uh, the uh, this uh, so your your uh, cutoff frequency is actually band width of your final filter. Uh, then you select the window shape for stop band attenuation. Add some error margin if it's a band stop. Uh, then you add just the window width for transition bandwidth. So just how many points you take. 
then transformation. That's all what there is in windowing method. Okay, and today we have two topics. I go continue, uh, continue straight to the other topic, which is the IIR filter design. There. Okay, which is basically just filter design number two. Um, so, the good things about FIR was that it uh, gives linear phase response, then and uh, it's quite, it's quite a straightforward design procedure. IIR filters will never give you linear phase response. It can be almost, but never exact, except if you to do post-processing and do zero phase filtering, meaning that you filter the data twice by reversing the time of the middle. But, IIR filters in general, they can give you better amplitude response with lower number of calculation than FIR, meaning that if you are uh, designing a, uh, uh, say, some uh, DSP software, this is cheaper. Your employer will appreciate you picking up, you know, this method since it uh, doesn't take that much uh, computing power, meaning cheaper. Anyways, the uh, applications, audio filters, equalizers, so graphic equalizer, you can make band, uh, this, this kind of bank of uh, filters and then just adjust the weight of them. Feedback reduction is also just IIR filter, adaptive IIR filter. Uh, wherever you need very high Q factor, so uh, basically center frequency divided by band with the Q factor. Then, uh, okay, I have one one missing here. It's the of course controlling loops. Yeah, control uh, 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 loop is IIR loop. So, uh, what is basically the uh, uh, back side of it, it uh, usually requires a little bit complex design methods. The uh, FIR is nice. You, you just need pen and paper. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, we have computers. And these, these are complex design methods. They are quite well known and they are not, uh, any, they are not too many secrets on them. So, well, but anyways, uh, about the uh, filter design methods, uh, they are more than, well, I, 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 actually the last one, the optimized methods, that covers a lot of dif different methods there. But basically, uh, there's uh, the one, say, bookcase is the uh, uh, textbook case, is the bilinear transformation of classical meaning analog filters. So there are digital uh, counterparts for Chebyshev, Bessel, Butterworth uh, filters or elliptic filters. So those are analog filter design by using the, uh, on analog filters you would do the uh, the Salenki kind of filter structures. But then in here you basically do uh, start with the analog filter transfer function and then replace the S on that one by two divided by sampling time times Z minus one divided by C plus one. So what that one actually does philosophically, you remember the S plane for the filter design, analog filter. 
uh, you have the complex axis goes like that, where the J omega is actually uh, resides when you do the frequency analysis. Uh, in digital domain, we have the unit circle. So this transforms the J axis of S plane into unit circle of Z plane. So it takes from plus in infinity J omega to minus infinity J omega and just squeezes into, into unit circle. <laughs> yeah, uh, which means it warps a bit the frequency space. It's really a warping. A lot. Anyhow, it's 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 method that gives you a filter. Nothing wrong with it. Um, another one is the uh, uh, parametric modeling. I call this one parametric modeling. It starts from the well, uh, almost the same. Instead of that uh, transfer function. If, you, if, if it has a transfer function, you can actually just write it as a differential equation. It's exactly the same thing. Just different, uh, 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 different uh, presentation, different presentation. Then replace the time derivative on the difference equation with ha. Huh, first order difference. So this is delta x divided by delta t. So that's an approximation. Of course, it has error on it. So we make the error here. In here, we made the error here by warping the frequency space. Here we make the error here. Uh, so basically, the frequency space remains linear, same as in this sampling of the impulse response of the real system. But we also here have the ABS in same similar effect as in the FIR cutting the uh, cutting the uh, or forcing infinite impulse response as finite impulse response. But yeah, can be done. Direct design. Change the system coefficient recursively to minimize the RMS difference between design and real amplitude response. <laughs> uh, there's only one filter which is worth of designing that way. Then there are some optimized methods, uh, basically same as here, but using some serious optimization methods to find the optimum between the fit, uh, fitting the parameters that it fits the uh, this, uh, or minimize the cost function. Okay, good. So I have a couple of uh, slides more. So the first uh, method uh, is so basically this this band stop notch filter is the direct design method. Uh, and yes, it's doable, and especially if you want to get rid of one single uh, frequency on your <coughs> data. For example, if you have a sampling system and somehow you notice there is a single frequency noise coming out from somewhere, meaning, well, electric appliances, 50 hertz. That's quite exactly 50 hertz, actually, that comes out of the outlet. Because otherwise you couldn't make a, this kind of electric networks that has, you know, different uh, these uh, transformer stations which are feeding the same line. You need to know exactly the phase there in between the, the, the power generator and the electric line to feed the electricity into same network. So you can count on that 50 hertz, or is it 60 here? It's 50, 50 or 60 hertz on AC outlets. 50, okay, yeah. United States has 60. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. But still the same thing. They are they are quite accurate. You can synchronize a clock on it. There. Good. Ha! Ah, that's actually great way of designing <laughs> one filter. So if you have a system, let's think of a uh, first tabula rasa gate. Uh, we have a system and then we notice that it uh, measures, for example, at uh, uh, one kilohertz. So that angle here, actually the sampling rate over two is one kilohertz. And then you find out, okay, there's not 50 hertz, but 100 hertz uh, humming. Well, if you do the uh, uh, linear power supply, the, the, the first, the fundamental frequency on that one would be 100 hertz, the rectifier. So you have 50 hertz, but after rectifier, it looks like that. So it basically is 100 hertz is the uh, biggest noise term there, which is somewhere in here. That angle would be something like that 100 hertz. Uh, easy way to get rid of that. Put a zero pair on the unit circle. We know from the yesterday, if you put a, a zero on the unit circle, what comes out is actually minimum, like that. Although if you put just the, this uh, zero, so then you also, of course, need the uh, double ball here. Simple design, it looks like FIR still, okay, but unfortunately that will distort your signal quite a lot. All right, so how to fix this problem and get, get our signal uh, to the amplitude level back to the unity gain, so that's the optimal. Optimal would be just to cut one frequency here and everything passes like that. How about adding a compensating pole very close to that point? So we add amplification of the same frequency. So that would actually do the trick and after that design we have a something like that. So this compensates basically the gain. So if you think of the uh, ratio of those uh, distances, when we are here, we, that point actually have about the same distance to that point and that point and those also. So the ratio of those distances will be one. Okay, good. And farther you go here, those are even closer to one, this ratio. Yeah, good. When you are close to that uh, unit circle, actually, or uh, close to those special points, let's mark it. Um, so this is a, a blow up picture. That's the angle. That's the zero, that's the pole. Okay, whoops, ah, not that one, this one here. Uh, all right, so when we are close to that point, basically you can find a distance here where you actually, this distance, well, we have marked this one x. Here we have also the same distance x. That distance would be roughly square root 
2 times x. Roughly, not exactly. So this is, this is well, there you have 90 degree angle. Although this is not a, a straight line, but still it doesn't, uh, it doesn't basically, it's only a little bit, tiny amount of uh, difference to the straight line distance. Uh, so basically that distance is square two of x which means that our the half width of the filter is also x. Well, that's where you have the radius x and divided by square root 2 times x. So 1 over square root of 2, which is same as minus 3 dB point. So basically, the half width of the filter uh, uh, is same as that distance x. And will be calculated the same way as you would calculate that 100 hertz here. Okay, good. So that way you can get rid of one single frequency uh, dis disturbing your signal. All right, then we have this um, set of classical filters. And now we are talking about uh, the uh, uh, the bilinear transformation uh, method. So they are basically these uh, classical filters also have the digital counterparts. So there we have the uh, Butterworth filter which has a, a flat passband, Chebyshev type 1, uh, the, the, uh, which has uh, the, the equal ripple on pass band, high attenuation on stop band, and then we have elliptic, which basically uh, doesn't have any zeros on the unit circle, so it just goes and goes and goes like that, but it has a, uh, some ripple on the uh, pass band. Then you, we would also have the bezel, but I don't see a reason why to use bezel. So the amplitude response is not that great, and because the bilinear transformation, it's not even close to linear uh, phase response anymore. On analog filters, Bessel is the, as close as you can get to the linear phase response, but not here because we warped, warped the, uh, uh, the, the uh, <sighs> warped the frequencies axis. Um, and then, of course, if you need the uh, linear phase response, then post-processing would give you the, the zero phase filter, meaning no phase shift at all, zero shift. Um, okay, uh, there's also median filter. Median filters actually are very useful in, in uh, in image processing, uh, not that much on a, any, oh, well, if you have a system which sometimes gives, once in a while you know that gives totally bogus value, and if you cannot fix it otherwise, then you can use a median filter to get those bogus values out. But I don't, think of any other use right now for the media filter in 1D. But in images, for example, if we have bad values or bad pixels on on our image, so that, that we have just four by four pixels and one is bad somehow, for example, it gives always a, a highest possible value or zero all the time. So what we can do, we can calculate a median value of those pixels 
which in this case the median would be that gray value and then subtract that median uh, it basically uh, 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 or replaced by the median value so so basically we are replacing that center value now with the median and if you do that one for the whole whole system then it's uh, hold the picture then basically it takes out speckle from the image you know speckle well that's bad pixels okay um uh, but anyhow the uh these uh, image sensors on nowadays they are quite good they don't usually have many bad pixels at all but if you do then you would the medium filter would be the one to want to get rid of them uh, okay uh, then one more filter type since it might actually come handy sometimes say for example if you have uh, if you need to optimize signal to noise ratio of the system uh, or, or, or receive signal then you could try so-called matched filter so basically, uh, this is this is used in radar technology, where you uh, send, say, chirp pulses or some other kind of pulses that you don't totally, you cannot control what the shape of the pulse is. So you cannot then do a, a um, uh, say, theoretical model for that signal what you are sending. Then you could use matched filter meaning that you are measuring the signal and then time reverse it and use that as the impulse response of the system uh, to filter and that basically matches exactly your uh, this this impulse what you are sending and uh, it uh, filters everything else well it filters uh, attenuates everything else it doesn't totally eliminate everything else but that's optimal for signal to noise ratio for radar kind of applications and yeah the, so so the good thing also is there that the uh, this filter does not affect to the original signal shape at all only the noise part all right that was the uh, FIR and IIR filters. And uh, okay, uh, what next? Uh, it's just about lunch time. But before going to lunch, actually, I will show you also something else. I, I added yesterday here a, a feedback page. So at some point, we, when you feel like it, just go and fill this survey. Uh, basically, there are some required fields. Name is optional, so if you wish to leave anonymous uh, 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 feedback, that's fine. I'm I'm not taking anything, you know, uh, personally. So give me feedback what you really think of. Uh, yeah, well, this is just for because I'm. Uh, actually having this uh, same course in other universities also so please feel there so Tokyo Kosen uh, and then basically just how satisfied were you the, on the course overall how did the workload match to the three ECTS credits so well uh, three ECTS credit means basically a, a roughly one semester long course with the three hours a week roughly not exactly uh, structure so how did all of this material what I have actually helped and how about the uh, assignments did you like the assignments that they actually helped learning the topic and then of course you can write your whatever you think of there in English, please. 
<laughs> I am st still struggling on, on my Japanese language, you know. <laughs> okay, so let's see where I was I. Um, yeah, so, so we have two uh, exercises here. Uh, I will show you one more thing on the... Um, on my um, this scoreboard, I also added here. Oh, by the way, I I updated this one uh, just this morning. This morning, and I also added here the deadlines. So those are Friday afternoons, basically. So you can work on the exercise, and then you know on a weekend you go and have fun. And then Monday you can continue the next exercise. <laughs> but anyways, so so uh, everyone has returned already this week exercise. I basically the this trip uh, gentlemen who still can make some uh, small fixings of the uh, exercise. The other students have scored already ten out of ten points. And then I have received returns from six. So, shot, uh, you haven't returned the second exercise yet, but, but, but it's due next week. Yeah, next week, yes, ninth. So that's month and day. I think that's the way you are using the calendar, right? First month and then date. Yeah. So ninth, ninth so that's next week. Friday uh, is the deadline. For that one, a week after that, uh, exercise three, week after that, exercise four, and week after that, exercise five. Ha! Huh. Excellent. So, I have a good feeling about this, and since most, most of you already have returned the second exercise. Like, so, basically, if you score 10 points also here, then you already passed the course in Finnish scale. <laughs> We have the 40%, uh, the, 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 uh, but you know, it's not enough. You really should shoot for the highest grade. Good. All right. So that's all for today's show. So after we come back from the lunch around one o'clock, then I will go through the, uh, the, the exercise tutorial. All right. Thank you.